Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Manning, and I'm a graduate student at Lerner College, and I'm the social media coordinator of the Women's Leadership in Initiative at UD. I'm also a proud Blue Hen student athlete on the women's track team here at Delaware. I am honored to welcome you all today for the last um, series of the Women's Leadership Initiative Spring Webinar Series, Trailblazers and Changemakers. This series, we've been highlighting the work of women who are really advocating for change. And while their expertise might be very different, the work they're doing all has a very common thread. They're working for social change, social justice and equity. So although this is the last webinar in our series, if you enjoyed our content this spring, stay tuned for our podcast that will be launching this summer. It's called Hear Her Story, Inspiring Women Leaders of Today and Tomorrow. In this series, we will talk with professional women in the community about their career journeys and what advice they would give to young women who may be graduating soon and starting their own career pathways. So stay tuned for that. We would also like to thank the sponsors that allow us to bring you this content for free. We would like to highlight and thank Barclays, Investnet, Delaware Today, and Wawa. And we would especially like to thank you and highlight our UD partner, PNC Bank. Thank you so much for your support. So by now we know that many of you are beyond familiar with Zoom, but just in case, this meeting will be held in a Zoom webinar format. You can see and hear us, but we can't see and hear you. We do, however, welcome the really robust interaction with all of you through the chat that I can already see everyone's involved in. So we'll hope that you'll continue as you have in the past sessions to use the chat for questions, comments, reactions, or for any additional advice. We will try to get to the questions in the chat at the end of the webinar. We will also be live tweeting throughout the session um, at UD Women Lead that you can see there on the slide. And we'll also be using the hashtag trailblazingwoman. If you would like to live tweet alongside us, please you use this hashtag trailblazingwoman. So um, today I'm very honored to be here with our speakers, Coach Adair and Erin Kane. Natasha Adair was selected as just the fourth women's basketball head coach in the program's very illustrious history on May 14th, 2017. And she's in her fourth season with the Blue Hens during this 2021 campaign, which was very successful. Adair, who has, been, who has more than 20 years of coaching experience under her belt, has received the national attention of USA Basketball and currently serves as an assistant coach for the under-18 women's national basketball team. And she's also spoken at the USA Basketball Las Vegas Coach Academy. We also have Erin Kane, who is an athlete branding and partnerships expert with over 15 years of experience in the sports and entertainment business. She has worked across various sports and with athletes at all levels, including WNBA MVP and Delaware alum, Elena Deladon and Asia Wilson, and NASCAR champion, Jimmy Johnson, softball icon, Jenny Finch, NBA rising star, Trey Young, and PGA tour legend, Phil Michelson. She works daily with the world's most recognizable brands such as Gatorade, Coke, Nike, Wendy's, and Chobani, among many others. She's also the founder of the Clarion Agency, which is an organization dedicated to women in sports. Coach Adair and Erin, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. We're excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Thanks too. for having me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to get us started, can you both um, tell us the story of how you got to where today? Like what, um, what led you to know that you had a passion for sports and particularly women in athletics? Um, well, for me, I, you know, I, I grew up playing sports. I played it, you know, at, at the collegiate level, um, came out of high school, an, an All-American. Uh, and so I found myself after college uh, yearning for more. Uh, I graduated with a communications degree, minor in marketing. So I, I was working in the athletic department uh, as the assistant athletic director for our alumni association. So fundraising, but I just kept gravitating back to the gym. And, and at that time, I would, I would go in and, and ask my coach, is there anything that I could do? Can I just practice with the team today? Do you need, me, do you need my help in any capacity? But not knowing um, what was to come. 
and, and I'll tell you, I got started based on a relationship. And, and that's the word that I really want to stress. Uh, you're never too young to understand the importance of who you meet and first impressions are everything. Uh, but when I got started, it, it was because I ran into uh, a coach who had recruited me in high school, bumped into him nine years later, uh, and pretty much offered me the job to be an assistant coach at Georgetown University on the spot. And so just that connection that we made at 16, 17 years old, um, fast forward nine years, afforded me an opportunity. And now 23 years later, here I am. Wow, that's an awesome story. And I know um, in our little prep session before you mentioned a really cool story about how you got the job at Delaware. I was wondering if you could expand on that because I, I just love that story. Well, absolutely. Our AD, Chrissy Raywalk, if you all don't know, I mean, she's relentless. And, and that's the word that we use in describing her in, in a good way. Um, I was the, the head coach at, at Georgetown University at the time, and I didn't know her. You know, I, n I never met her, met her, but she called and we had a conversation on the phone. And at that time, I told her, you know, at this, at this moment, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested. I'm not looking forward, you know, moving. I, I just gotten here, I've been here three years. We're doing some special things. And 48 hours later, she called me back and, and that's Christy. But when she called me back, there were, she, she, she had a whole slew of other people, President Asanis, Elaney, his wife, Martin Inglesby, our head men's basketball coach, Danny Rocco, you know, our football coach, all of them were now in the conversation. And just speaking with them, listening to their why. And you want to align yourself with people who share the same vision, who are, who are driven just as you are on the same path, relentless. And at that point, the second time, I knew I made the right choice when I told her yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that she brought a whole crowd. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She came prepared. She came prepared. <laughs> and Erin, tell us a little bit about how you found yourself. I mean, becoming, founding an organization is amazing. Well, my, so I grew up very much around sports. My dad, mm -hmm. um, who's also a Delaware alum, uh, was a, was a division one golf coach until I was about eight or nine years old and then became a, a golf agent. And um, actually in college and then just a little bit after, while I always played sports, I, I completely took a left turn into another field, but by chance and by relationships, found myself um, being offered a job at a small boutique agency where my dad worked. <laughs> Although I always have to say, I, you know, I. I was so worried about the perception of nepotism mm -hmm. and still am to some extent that um, they had actually put a moratorium on hiring any family members at that agency, but really needed someone. They were in a pinch in the baseball division, especially. And, um, and I think there was an ease and comfort for me in that environment. So I was hired and I would joke that I was basically like a warm body who seemed remotely competent, <laughs> but had evidently made a good first impression. Um, for coach Adair, you know, and, and got a job there and then really, really um, was very challenged by the environment and um, not so much the work, but specifically some of the like dynamics in the environment. And I wanted to be part of the change um, for those. So worked there, came over to Octagon, um, which is a much larger global agency, enjoyed working there, but truly my heart and passion is um, helping promote women in sports and whether that's on the field or behind the scenes, you know, we're, we're still in the minority in the sports space. And so I wanted to do something, um, really step out of an existing system, step to the side of it and say, okay, what can we build over here from the ground up that maybe mm -hmm. take some of the best practices from over here, but is a fresh way uh, of looking at what we do. So yeah. that's why I started Clarion. Absolutely. And um, I know you noted some challenges and I'm sure both of you and I mean myself, I've experienced this at just as a woman involved in athletics. What are some of the challenges that you face and describe them and also how did you overcome them? Um, I'm going to start with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, that first job, I was really challenged by the environment. I'd, I'd worked before in a field that 
was relatively diverse. Um, the, the environments I was in were, were um, people were thoughtful about that. And then I, I came to work at this particular agency and um, I walked in and it was like men in offices around the perimeter and women were in the center in, in kind of a bullpen. And there were different rules for the women and there were rules like, you know, they didn't want a man's voice answering the phone in that office. Mm -hmm. I remember one time um, someone called, someone in management and said, you guys are gonna get dinged for discriminatory practices. You only have men on your company website. And then there was, I was responsible for the website at that point. So there was this huge panic and it was like, put all the women on the website. Mm -hmm. And I remember this older woman who worked at the company going, you got, the problem is not the website. The problem is you only have women in administrative roles in this company. So even if you put us on the website, it's still not like great. So um, that environment for me was like, how do I get through that? How do I break through their perceptions about me? Mm -hmm. I realized that if you're going to do anything in this business, you have to be a revenue generator. That's what's valued. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took a look at, okay, how can I do that? I thought there's two ways. You can do endorsements mm -hmm. or you can be an agent. And I was flat out told you cannot be an agent because you're a woman. Like mm -hmm. those were the words that were spoken. It was not subtle. It wasn't implied it was explicit because I have children because I mean there's you know I was given a laundry list of reasons that had to do with me being a woman mm -hmm. and so for me the path forward was providing revenue through doing endorsements for the athletes that that company represented and by doing that I became the first female executive at that company I, I was um I became the head of sales in the sales department of one person, <laughs> but I was the head of sales and I, I, uh, I got an office and everything. I had to fight for it, but I got an office. Um, they, they even told me, they were like, you can't have an office. It'll upset all the other women at the company. We're not. And I said, but the guy who was in the role before me had an office. I have to talk about confidential things. We don't need everybody hearing these conversations. I want an office. They eventually agreed to that. And the very first morning that I walked in to, to go into my brand new office, um, there were flowers and balloons and cards from all the other women who worked there congratulating me and saying, you know, finally one of us. And I, I, that was a really special moment. And I think also speaks to perceptions, stereotypes, and then mm -hmm. what we're really about. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, women supporting women. I think that's Absolutely. a great story. And what about you, Coach Adair? <laughs> well, I think challenges, you know, Aaron talked about so many and, and some that we're still currently facing. But for me, I'll, I'll say when I started coaching, um, I was a single mom. And, and I was questioned if I could do the job based on being a single mom, not if I was qualified or not, but but being a single mom. And, and I'll tell you, um, that fueled me. Uh, but but there's so many challenges in, in being um, in a male dominant, if you will, sport. Uh, you're always questioned if you can handle certain things. You're always questioned um, if you're better. Uh, and I'll tell you, I've had to have male allies along the way. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, I have a, a coach that's been with me for years. And he's been one behind the scenes to speak up in, in moments that uh, I couldn't, uh, to share light on some uncomfortable situations that I wasn't privy to. Um, and, and so just having advocates along the way, but there's so many challenges. You know, I'm a mom, I have a 23 year old and I have a 15 year old. And so as a mom, you have to let go of the guilt, the mom guilt because it, your, your role doesn't change because you're in a leadership role. You still have to be mom. You still have to do homework. You still have to be present and show up. And, and so really working through that along my 20 plus year career is letting go of the guilt um, and making sure you have those allies uh, to help you navigate it in rooms, in areas that you aren't necessarily invited in. Um, and then for me being a woman of color, uh, there, you know, when I was playing, there weren't many representation matters across, you know, all, all opportunities across all corporations. Um, and, and along my journey, I, I, I was the first black coach in any sport when I was the head coach of the College of Charleston in 2012. And where I think that that um, I was excited to, to kind of carry that, that load, but 2012 was not long ago. And so that just lets you know 
how far we've come, but how, how much more work we have to do. Here at the University of Delaware, the first black women's basketball coach um, here. And, and so there's so many things that uh, in sitting in this role, what I represent, but I never looked at it as a challenge. It's either an obstacle or an opportunity. Uh, and for me, it's been an opportunity to be an example, not only to my children, but to my players, uh, to other women. Um, the road is not easy, but as you navigate it, you build strength, you build confidence. Uh, but if you just stay true to who you are and your purpose um, and, and align people along the way that, that will be your advocate, that will be your ally, that will support you, um, then you will be able to reach that level of success that you want. Yeah, that's your, amazing. your story coach data reminds me of, um, there's so many women in sports who have children, right? So, yes. and it is a unique challenge. It has as much to do with perception as the realities of what that looks like. Absolutely. And, um, I work with a, a, a female athlete who, um, now has three children, but at the time just had one little, little boy who, you know, her husband was a professional athlete. She was playing for team USA. Mm -hmm. an Olympic summer, their schedules meant that they were going to have two full days to spend with, with each other the entire summer. And she was taking this baby around the country in, I mean, women's sports, let's talk, there's not chartered planes. They were right. literally in a bus. It was like, we kept calling it the, um, a league of their own part two four. <laughs> yes. They were crisscrossing the country in this bus with like a trailer in the back. Mm -hmm. And she was sobbing. I mean, she was in tears over this calendar. And um, she said to me, her mom, who is incredibly wise, was like, you know, take it the way you do on the mound. Yeah. One pitch at a time. One, you can take it an hour at a time. You can take it a day at a time. You can take it a second at a time. But yes. just put one foot in front of the other, the mixing mm -hmm. metaphors, but break it down and just get through it. And so much of it, I feel like it's important for young women to know is just attrition, like just it stay is. in the space, just don't quit. All you have to do is show up and not quit. And mm -hmm. that actually is enough some days, right? Like it's not always, you don't have to do something amazing every single day. Sometimes you just have to show up. And I'll tell you, Erin, there, there was a moment where I was um, pregnant with my daughter and in, in the career, you, you know, there were a lot of times where I didn't want to say I, I can't come today because I wanted to go to my son's game. Um, you, you know, I wanted to prove that I could do the job. So, so there were, there were times that I put my family and my children on the side to make sure it didn't impact my growth and my climb. Um, but as I got older and, and I saw uh, the disappointment and I, I saw that I couldn't get those moments back uh, with my daughter, it, it's been completely different but I'm also in a role now where I can make decisions. I can schedule practice around her volleyball schedule. I can take time and hit the pause button, um, hire the staff that, that I can trust that if, I am, if, if I'm gone because of a family uh, function that we won't skip a beat. But you have to mature into that. When you start in any profession, you, you hit the ground running and your eyes are down and you're working. But if, if one piece of advice that I got from, from one of my old coaches, he said, don't be me. He said, when I started this profession, I was at the birth of my child. The last time I looked up, I was giving her away at her wedding. Mm -hmm. And that, he missed everything in between. And, and so that stuck with me. Uh, and I said, I won't do that. I won't apologize. I won't make excuses. Uh, I'm a mom and I'm a mom first. Yeah, absolutely. I think bringing up the importance of balance is, is so necessary, especially as women and having our family. So I, I love that we that was brought up. And somebody in the chat, I just really like this, said, channeling our challenges and using them as fuel. And I think that that's something that it, it just helps so much to just use them and go for it. And that sometimes it's enough and you'll get to where you want to get. So I really like that. Um, so Coach Adair, you mentioned allies, and um, that was actually the title of our last webinar series was Allies, Advocacy, and Accomplishment. So I would love to ask Erin, um, can you note any allies that helped you along the way? Um, any stories that you have about allyship? Because I just mm -hmm. think everyone's got to have allies, right? Yeah. 
Well, yes. So first of all, one of the things that I, I am very proud of is I always talk, I noticed when I started working in sports, the, the guys that I was working with would say like, oh, I got a buddy for this. Whatever it was we needed, somebody had a buddy. <laughs> and I thought that is not really, in my experience, how women talk <laughs> to each other. We're, um, and I just, it made me start thinking about my network, their network, how that works. Mm -hmm. And so I joke often about this like old girls club that I'm trying to, <laughs> to build just, which is really, honestly, it's a network of women in sports <laughs> who support each other. Um, and I don't know if anybody on here has seen uh, the, the women who work at ESPN, like Sarah mm -hmm. Spain and Katie yes. Nolan, and they did this hilarious video where they're like a secret society in these black hoods that's like dedicated to ruining sports by men, for men by being women in sports. Mm -hmm. Very funny, not totally what I'm about, but I, the, you know, the secret handshake for my old girls club, like we're working on it. Um, but I feel really strongly too. I mean, my dad was my first and biggest ally. He always mm -hmm. had my back. That was a huge gift. It's a mm -hmm. relatively cutthroat industry. And so knowing that I always had one person I could trust 100% was huge. Mm -hmm. um, and also watching how he operated in his career, which was the choice to be a good person, mm -hmm. not I mean, you can choose whether you're going to stab somebody in the back. You can choose whether you're going to put your own interests ahead of theirs. You can choose what kind of clients you work with to some extent. And um, so that helped. And he also said to me, I was very stressed about being in this business and being a woman, mm -hmm. especially in that first company I worked for. And he said, he's like, it's your differentiator. From a marketing standpoint, there's like thousands of guys who want to do what you're doing. And they're all sort of the same. And he's like, you, you're a woman, you have a different background in terms of your education. You, you know, he just said, don't try to hide those things. Don't be ashamed of them. That was important advice. And then I know we talked on our pre-call. There was a moment at a, uh, a small work conference that I went to where we were talking about, you know, how we can improve things in, uh, from an inclusive this and diversity standpoint at the company I was working for internally. And I raised my hand and I said, it's, this is a great conversation and I'm glad we're having it. It's important and necessary, but also like there are things out there that prevent women from being agents that are sort of external forces that happen outside right. of the company. And how do we protect the 26 year old young woman, 28 year old? How do we provide a path to success for them in an area where we don't have total control it's not in the company and I said you know at that point and this is not that long ago it's definitely within you know the last five years I said uh, I know I don't know every single agent that's out there but I know a lot of them and I know most of the women mm -hmm. and I can count on two hands the number of women agents in the big three professional sports so baseball basketball and football and that has changed. Even in five years, there are in, an increasing number of women working in those spaces and representing talent on rosters. There's a lot of people who are registered agents. There aren't a lot who have necessarily, necessarily players on rosters. And one of the men in the room, um, who was a basketball agent, mm -hmm. looked shocked and he said, he raised his hand and he goes, oh my gosh, I never thought about it that way. How can I help? And it was a, such a powerful moment because it, I think it was the first time ever someone had said how I, I recognize what you're saying and how can I help? And it led to this, we ended up having this super late night conversation. There were three of us <laughs> plotting uh, and making a plan for how we could change the world. But, um, but it's just so important to know that you have people like that in your corner who are on the same page and who are there to help and who you can lean on and rely on. Yeah, definitely. And I think, being able to admit that you can't do everything on your own, right? Like that somebody's going to be there to help you and, and get the outcome that you want. So, yeah, I definitely agree. And um, my next question is you mentioned men talking about, oh, I have a buddy for that. I, you know, that's not like how women really speak a lot of the time. So if men have their, have their buddies, what, what do women bring that men don't? Like what do women bring to the table in Coach Adair and mm -hmm. basketball and the NCAA um, and the sports agency management world? 
what what skills do women have? <laughs> How much more time do we have? <laughs> because we can, you know, I can talk about the men's empty box, right? But but I'll tell you for, for what women bring, I mean, we bring compassion, right? We're nurturers by nature, we're we're maternal, we're strategic. Um, we foster relationships and we're intentional about doing that. Um, we're multitaskers, uh, we're flexible, uh, but I, you know, we don't skip steps either. Uh, we're very intentional about how we plan, how we prepare um, to see it through. But I, but I think, you know, just for me, I think all of those are very important because we are working with 18 to 23 year olds daily and, and you have to um, have that compassion. You have to be maternal. You have to be, you know, strategic in all these areas, but we take pride in being the example. Uh, it, it, you know, I love being that role model. I love wearing that hat. Uh, but, but I think it's just being able to multitask and, and carry on all these different traits and wanting to. Um, but um, I, I think we could talk about that all day, but I think just more of being compassionate. I think we're flexible. Uh, I think we adjust on the fly. Um, we, we, we're, we're rock stars um, and, and, and in every aspect, but, but I do think that those are things and those are really important traits um, as we are leaders uh, and, and as we are just implementing change and, and fighting for change. I, I think that uh, these are all great traits uh, to be successful. So I, I started, when I recognized that that was a difference in how the men around me were communicating, I started thinking about why. And I was like, no, I think sometimes we, or maybe it's just me, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe just me at that stage, I was right. reluctant to recommend people for something because I was so, felt so precarious in my position. I did not feel confident enough to recommend someone else that might reflect poorly on me, even if I had a ton of faith in them. And so for me, that recognizing that was just a shift to like, no, I am consciously going to not do that. And I'm consciously going to recognize I am stable and firm and solid and good at what I do. And I'm going to recommend people that I think are great. I have great instincts for people. I'm going to allow myself <laughs> to acknowledge that. And then I'm going to help my friends, colleagues, people I know and believe in to be put in really great positions to help me and also to succeed and help mm -hmm. the other people. And you know, it took some time. I, that was not like it happened overnight there was a process of me realizing, you know what, that person did not do a good job at that. And I thought this other person would be better. I knew they would be better. And I didn't speak up. I didn't push it hard enough. And realizing that I should trust myself. That mm -hmm. is sort of the under underlining thing. And then the other thing I just always go back to is women in male dominated mm -hmm. fields are usually twice as prepared, work mm -hmm. twice as hard <laughs> and are, so why wouldn't you select them, right? right? Like we have had to fight so hard to be where we are. There's no room for error. You know, I saw in the comments, um, someone mentioned Muffet McGraw and Don Staley right. and you know, this year's NCAA women's basketball final was two women of color coaching against each other. Mm -hmm. There still are not enough women of color in women's basketball coaching in head coaching right. positions, there are still, it's still male dominated there. It's not like women's sports are only coached by women mm -hmm. after title nine, when there was real money in coaching women's sports in came male coaches. Right. So when you're thinking about empty roles, hiring, bringing people in to do things, retraining ourselves to realize that women in order to exist in these spaces and be in these roles have had to overcome more obstacles, more adversity, work twice as hard. There's no room for error. Mm -hmm. Zero. Why would you not want, why would you not want that person? That person's going to be a rock star, right? Like, so to me that it, I, again, this is like a conscious process for me of readjusting the way I think about things and not just taking this sort of lazy path to like, common perception um, and letting that rule how I how I think about different spaces or different um, bringing different people into them. Yeah. And Aaron, Aaron, I'm glad you touched on that. Um, I'm very I'm unapologetic in, in, in some things that I do and in, in hiring you use that word. 
um, I sit in this seat because I had a coach that was a woman and she was a woman of color uh, mm -hmm. back in, in the 90s where <laughs> she might have been one of five. Uh, and I'm intentional in hiring. I have three former players that are on my staff. And it's about me pulling them up and, and making sure they have those opportunities. Now, they're prepared. They, they just didn't get the job because I coached them. They were the best. They, they had the leadership qualities. The qualities. They, they have the talent. They have the IQ. Um, but I was intentional in making sure that I give them the same opportunity that was afforded to me. And so as I continue to grow and, and they continue to grow and scoot over another seat, it is, it is my passion. It is my tireless work ethic every day to make sure they're ready when their name is called. And, and so I also say with all the traits that we have, be unapologetic. You know, don't apologize for who you are. Don't apologize for the decisions that you make. Um, because like you said, they're, they're, they're supported with passion. They're supported with, with love. They're supported with purpose. Uh, and, and I just think that um, we have to forgive ourselves for a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. I like that you said being unapologetic and also something we talked about before was not being afraid to be yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. just, okay, you're in this man's world, but not to change who you are to start acting like a man because we have all these qualities as you all just both just mentioned that bring so much more to the table and so much more to sports so I think that's really important mm -hmm. um so my next question for you is um obviously this past year has been kind of a roller coaster with the pandemic um in all areas of sport NCAA professional um I mean my life was completely changed I came to Delaware because of the pandemic which ended up being amazing and so right. um both of you how did your approach to your job change during the pandemic what sort of things did you find yourselves doing that maybe you wouldn't have done without the pandemic well I, I would say my, my approach didn't change um to the big picture but I think navigating um through the pandemic, uh, which we, we have no experience of, of navigating through, I, I think then it goes back to those traits, being able to adjust, being able to adapt. Um, but the biggest thing was making sure our players were okay uh, and making sure as their leader that they knew that we were gonna get through it uh, and, and get through it together. But I'll tell you, our world changed March 11th um, with the pandemic. Uh, but leading past that social injustice, um, you know, unrest in this country. But uh, the, the kids, you know, I, I remember meeting with them immediately after our season got canceled, the death of Breonna Taylor, the death of George Floyd, um, they were hurting. And I asked two questions because in that moment, it was more about listening. And, and then that was going to help me devise my next steps. But they were hurting they, they were angry, they, were, uh, they had questions. And then I said, what do you need from me? And they said, direction. And at that point I knew it was time to act. And, and so we just had courageous conversations. I, th I think it was a time where we were forced to be together. We were in our little bubble. Um, we couldn't really leave out of it and, and go other places. And so it forced us to really learn about each other, um, learn about our heroes, learn about our hardships, learn about the highlights in our life. Uh, but also then empower them on what to do next. They, you know, they met as a team and they said, coach, we don't want to be just doing what's trending on social. We want to leave a lasting impact. We want to help create change. And I'll tell you, our young people, let them use their voice. They are powerful. They are ready. Um, just encourage them and stand with them because they came together. They wrote letters to all the mayors here in the state of Delaware. And, and they talked about things that they wanted to see implemented. They wanted to ban the chokehold. They wanted to remove excessive use of force. Uh, they wanted to make sure police officers were, were wearing body cams and bring education uh, around policing um, here in our community. And to be able to take that information to our AD, Chrissy Raywalk, and, and she say, you know what? 
let's take this a step further. She wasn't an AD that silenced us. She wasn't an, an AD or an administration that told us we couldn't use our voice. We couldn't use our platform. She was right in there with us. The same promise that she made on day one. And, and so to have that administration, to have that support, we were then on a fast track. Uh, with the size of our state, we were able to get in front of the governor. We were able to meet with the attorney general, Kathy Jennings. And then probably two weeks later, June 26th, Executive Order 41 was passed, you know, banning the chokehold and excessive use of force. And our players were a part of that. So how awesome does that make me feel as a leader for them to know that in this state, they have affected change, real change that will last, <laughs> you know, a long time, way, way past uh, their graduation. And so I just think as a leader to be able to empower them to use their voice it was a direct connection to their performance on the court this year. I mean, we broke so many records um, that had been set years ago, 2012, 2013. Those were Elena's years, right? And we hadn't done a lot of those things since she took, since she was here. And so just to be able to empower them and watch them grow through a very uncertain time, a very difficult time, but knowing that their voice matters, their work matters. Um, I, I just think that we grew leaps and bounds this year in, in a time where uh, we really had no direction. We just listened to our hearts and we, we bound together as one. And uh, we had allies, we had resources that people supported us along the way. That's incredible. They get, that story gave me chills. <laughs> it is, it's amazing. Um, from my standpoint, <laughs> I, I had a very, so first of all, I had a client in China in January who like she left and I got a notification from the CDC mm. <laughs> like the next day <laughs> that there was this novel virus in China and they didn't really know. And so I remember distinctly and in, in about five days later, realizing, you know, China had just quarantined like overnight 50 million people and locked them down. And I was like, I have to get her out of there. <laughs> I don't have the best grasp on Chinese ge geography. I'm not sure where this is going. It's difficult to get information. So we, we, I brought her home. And from then it felt like a countdown um, until we were doing the same thing here. So uh, I went to the Pac-12 championship and then flew back and was supposed to be in LA for a recruiting meeting. Um, the, that Thursday, I flew back on a Monday. I was supposed to go back to the West Coast on a Thursday. And I just couldn't do it. I and then literally as that recruit was coming into this meeting, which we were then going to do by Zoom, um, the news came out that the final four, the tournament was canceled. And um, so, so that recruiting meeting didn't go very well and I did not sign her. <laughs> but, but um, you know, that was sort of the beginning. And then for me, my primary function that I can never forget is my job is to make money for my clients. And um, so I spent the first, it felt like a couple of months mm -hmm. checking in, making sure everybody was okay. They still held the WNBA draft. It was the first virtual draft, which, and it went really well. I had, I did have, was representing someone in the draft, um, but I was reading so many force majeure classes, <laughs> just make sure my clients were still going to get paid, even though there was this global pandemic. Um, and then to to coach Adair's point you know we saw Ahmad Arbery we saw mm -hmm. George Floyd we saw just I mm -hmm. still get choked up and chills thinking about it because there was just wave after wave of real trauma and um the, the athletes that I work with were feeling that so mm -hmm. a huge part of this past year and and then they went to play in a bubble Right? right. Like you're right. totally isolated from everything. Yeah. IMG Academy is fine. It's not like a great place to be stuck <laughs> when you're in your twenties and thirties. Yes. Um, so really my focus was on making sure my clients were financially stable and making sure that they were me mentally doing okay. And asking those same questions, like, how can I help? Mm -hmm. What do you need? Mm -hmm. What can I get from you? Are you okay? And making sure they had the resources they needed, both from the league or from 
sports psychologist, I know, whoever, whatever they needed, my job was to help them with that. And, and in the background also to, to create business opportunity. So mm-hmm. it was, it was a really interesting and challenging year, but I'm very pleased to say like the business didn't slow down. That right. was so interesting to me. I mean, at one point I was like, is the whole economy going to crash? Like you're, you're trying mm-hmm. part of being, well, part of being a mom and a woman <laughs> is trying to think two steps ahead. It's also a huge part of being an agent. So trying to anticipate what was coming and then make sure everybody was set up for success in whatever that environment was. It was, but it, you know, so 2020 felt like 10 years and also like three months. I mean, it was this weird accordion sensation of time. Um, and then obviously there's what you want to do on your own personal, right? In your own personal life. So you know, Lisa Borders is the former commission or the former president of the WNBA, and she's mm-hmm. also the former deputy mayor of Atlanta, which is an elected position. And she is friends with um, Senator Warnock, mm-hmm. and so getting her involved and team, making sure the I mean, I don't know if you saw the WNBA players wearing the boat Warnock shirts, yeah. but um, that all had to be created like in the, you know, on the back end of things, the players wanted it, but there was a huge group of people and that me included making things happen on the back end so that they had the platform so that they could leverage it to the fullest to, to impact and create change. And that I will hold on to as a huge silver lining in what was otherwise a really, you know, terrible year for, for lots of reasons. Yeah. Wow. And Erin, you talked about the personal level, right? We, I, we didn't even touch on that. Uh, my daughter, 15, virtual school. Um, yeah. she, still, she still has not been back in the school building. It's been a year. Uh, my son, graduating senior, college graduate. We don't get a graduation. Um, he's still in, in this climate of trying to business degree, um, yeah. graduated cum laude, still searching for a job. Uh, with within his field. And so trying to manage that as a mom, the emotions that they're going through, uh, but still navigating the waters for the team. And and so um, it felt like (laughs) 10 years. Absolutely. But I I will say it's getting better. But just having that support, and and I can't stress that enough. You talked about resources, you talked about the people that were helping you behind the scenes. And, and that's what I'm really proud of. And, and what we had here, what we have here at Delaware, just to be able to go to Christy, to be able to go to our president, um, to be able to meet with my administrators uh, about what the players need, about what I need, um, and, and then them help me along the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, amazing. I love the themes of just creating impact in a time when we can play our sport that's incredible um so just i'm just being cognizant of the time because we have a student on the line um sarah whited um she is a senior on the women's tennis team um and we're very happy to have her here to ask you guys a couple of questions so sarah i'm gonna hand it over to you thanks holly um first of all coach adair and aaron thank you so much for this awesome discussion. I think you guys are just so inspiring and I'm super grateful just to learn from you guys and be able to listen. So thank you so much again. Um, My first question has to do with um, the issues with um, what happened at the March Madness tournament, the kind of differences between the women and men, for those that don't know, um, pretty much um, at the NCAA March Madness tournament, the women um, received significantly less than the men received as far as gifts goes something called like swag bags mm-hmm. and then also just with other things with um, the weight rooms were so different the men had this huge weight room and the women had these teeny tiny little racks and mm-hmm. the men had a huge buffet of food and the women had these really kind of nasty looking little to-go boxes of food so um I would just love to hear um coach Adair especially from mm-hmm. a- coach and then Aaron from I'm sure you see this in so many other sports besides just like at the collegiate basketball level so I would love to hear from you guys about that well I I think that this is ongoing um you know having played the sport having been in it for for so many years uh you see the disparities you know but we're, we're talking about systemic and structural issues within the sport um and and you're right uh that there there's no excuse for it 
it should not have happened. Um, there were disparities. I mean, in fan attendance, there were disparities in food. There were disparities in the swag bag, uh, in the facilities. You're, you're talking about one rack, 12 dumbbells, a couple of yoga mats, uh, and an exercise bike. Uh, but then you, you see what the men, what the men had. And so, um, I think these are just bias, uh, that, that exist in our sport and in our game stereotypes, um, whether they're conscious, whether they're unconscious bias, but, but they're perpetuated when, when these things continue to happen. And, and so I, I think it's more about bringing awareness. Uh, we had prominent figures in our game, Muffet McGraw, Dawn Staley, speak up on it. Uh, social media exposed these disparities. And I'm glad that they did. Y you know, the NCAA is an all member institution and we wanna make sure that all members are represented in everything that we do. But uh, we are thankful that the tournament was able to take place, you know, all 64 teams in San Antonio, but uh, it, it's more about, um, we'll, we'll ne it'll never be equal, let's just be clear. But there needs to be more people that are intentional about making sure it's fair. Um, and, and that was not the case, but uh, the one rack, 12 dumbbells, a yoga mat, and then you look across or you look on social and you see what the men have. It was, it was, it was just, it was disrespectful uh, and, and it should not have happened. So I disagree that mm -hmm. things will never be fair. <laughs> Okay. Otherwise, I would not get up in the morning. <laughs> they don't ever be equal. You said it would be more fair, but never equal. I there's what really was so infuriating about it is that the NCAA doesn't even try because mm -hmm. the second that was shown, I had the CMO of Dick Sporting Goods called me right. to find I was on the phone with a pregnant woman who was one day away from giving birth <laughs> from Dick who had loaded you all that was were in San Antonio. People were so excited to contribute and support right. these women. Other brands called and said, can we send food trucks down? Can we send, you know, women's sports is important and people recognize that. And to me, the, all that said was like, who, who just didn't even bother to call, try, put in the effort. Like that to me was the worst part. We all know that there are disparities. We live it every day. Mm -hmm. But women's sports can do one thing men's sports can't, and that is get bigger. Yeah, That's number one. And number two, in basketball, women stay in college four years. They have to be 22 years old or a four-year college graduate right. in order to enter the WNBA draft. You don't have one and done players. Mm -hmm. They have four years to build a fan base, to engage with people, to grow. It is, it is such a growth opportunity. Women's sports overall are an undervalued asset that are just beginning to see the kind of investment that they deserve. So that's number one. And then number two, the, the part, the reason I say it should be more equal is because you look at baseball and softball. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I work with Jenny Finch. So her freshman year at the University of Arizona, only the national championship was televised. She was in that game. Her second year, more games were televised, but by her senior year, the entire tournament was televised on ESPN. It is a huge, huge boon for ESPN. They love it. The NCAA packages softball and baseball together to sell the broadcast rights. And they, ESPN values both sports equally. They draw the same numbers. Mm -hmm. And yet men's college world series plays in a $131 million stadium in Omaha. And the women are playing in something that hasn't been updated in 50 years with porta potties in the dugouts that reek. I mean, it is, there's no financial reason that there should be that much of a disparity. That's number one. And then the other thing that drove me absolutely bonkers, first of all, I need Sarah, like we're not even allowed to call the women's tournament March Madness. That yeah. is reserved yeah. for the men. They're protecting the brand, which makes my head wanna, like I wanna explode. And the other part of that is you've got, look, I know we're on a college Zoom call, so I should be like maybe biting my tongue like a tiny bit, but the head of the NCAA. You go right ahead, Erin. You go right ahead. You. The head of the NCAA made a, what is it? A 200 and, or three and a half billion dollar mistake with the men's broadcast rights. Is it really that hard to believe that he has undervalued or like the majority of money coming into sports is not tickets. 
anymore. It is the broadcast yeah. deals. Mm-hmm. So is it really hard that hard to imagine that if he goofed up the men's stuff that bad, that maybe, maybe he didn't quite get the women's right. And so when you have these press releases and this spin of like, oh, the men's tournament funds the women's tournament, they're losing money. Well, why is that? It's not on the players. It's not the quality of play. Maybe it's the media rights deal. And who did that deal? Not the players, not the coaches. I mean, we need to be very conscious of what we're being sold right. by people that have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are for their own benefit. So for me, I, I, I feel like <laughs> I live it every day. I fight it every day. I'm so happy after 15 years of doing this, that there's finally this kind of perception shift that's happened over the last year or two where again, you're seeing people are starting to understand the idea of investing in women's sports. We know that women's sports organically get only 4% of coverage that can be changed with intent and purpose. In 2020, the WNBA viewership went up 68% where men's sports were down. This idea and this opportunity for growth is, it is, I just don't want to lose the momentum. I mean, I think it's such an exciting time and social media is the great equalizer. We saw that with the tournament, right? Yeah. You cannot say no one is watching women's sports when the data from social media shows otherwise. The the 2021 WNBA draft had 6.5 million video views. You can't say nobody's watching. That's, I mean, so anyway, I'm totally on my soapbox, which I will step off of, but I no, feel no. so passionate about that. <laughs> there's so much there and there's so much more we can, um, we can do and leverage and invest in. And I agree. You yeah. know, definitely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for asking your question. Um, we've got about <laughs> four minutes. Left. I mean, it was great. <laughs> awesome. Like that's the meat of what we want to get into. So thank you for sharing all of that, Erin and Coach Adair. Um, so I'm just going to take one question from the chat, which was um, how can organizations like Women's Leadership Initiative, like any organizations that support women, amplify work that, you guys are doing like work women and sports I think just continue you know telling the story um social media is is one of the biggest vehicles advocates um to to share information uh but just having this forum having uh, this opportunity to to sit on this panel um and, and allow you know, just uh, us to share this information. I think that um, the more opportunities that we allow the conversation, that um, we open the airways for it, uh, I think that uh, it will continue to, um, it, it will just continue to have trajectory outward. And, and so I just think having opportunities to share and having opportunities for, for, for people to give us the opportunity to speak. I just, I think, just support each other. I mean, (laughs) when you see other women doing something awesome on a micro level or on this kind of platform, like, just share it. Yeah. Don't be shy. I mean, we, we have allies, but we also have to be each other's best advocates. Mm -hmm. And um, I often say, I wish I had an agent (laughs) because I am not good at advocating for myself in certain Mm -hmm. situations. But, you know, when I launched my company, I had a friend who's a woman was like, give me your social media. You are terrible at social media. Uh You need to blow this up. I'm going to do this for you because I care about you. And I think, you know, I'm grateful for that and appreciative of it. Meanwhile, however, I am totally the one like posting for (laughs) for various clients at times. So I'm just not good at doing it for myself. So I think just let's, you know, be thoughtful about how we're yeah. lifting up other people around us and, uh, you know, recommending people for things and, you know, we can all do it. We can all do more of it. Definitely. I like, I love the comment you said, social media is the great equalizer because it was in that situation with March Madness. Like no yeah. one, I mean, maybe coach Adair and Aaron, you would have known about it, but I wouldn't have known about it. Right. So, I mean, and it made me mad. Like I saw that on TikTok and I, I wanted to make a video about it. So I think you're right. Like 
letting it be known using social media and then actually having something to say about it is also important. Okay, so we have one more minute. So I'm going to ask a quick, <laughs> quick fire question because there's another one. Mm -hmm. um, who do you both look for for inspiration? I'll say my mom. Um, my mom, it, you know, I, <laughs> she is um, the strength of our family. Uh, she's a prayer warrior. Uh, I, I never see her flinch. She's a woman who currently uh, is living with an aneurysm, uh, was diagnosed with one at, at age 50. My mother is 79. Um, and, you, you know, when we first found out, she, you know, we were emotional and she looked at all of us and she said, I'm not done yet. And to watch her fight now, my mother's in the Hamptons, my mother's here, my mother's all over the place. Um, and, and I wish, you know, I, I, she is the source of strength uh, for, for me, for our family. Uh, if she can wake up and, and, ha and every day's a great day, I have nothing to complain about. So my mom. Well, well my mom's listening. So I'm <laughs> going to have to say her too, which, but it's also true. Like I will never, I will never not be grateful for my mom. I'm the oldest of six kids. My dad was on the road a lot as an agent and a coach. And she was fearless and did everything herself. I mean, I remember waking up in the night to like, you know, go to the bathroom or something. And she'd be down the hall, like wallpapering a bathroom to fix up the house, which we don't would sell. So that was her way of making money. Um, or even it never occurred to me that it, like she used to pile all six of us in the suburban and drive us 10 hours to go mm -hmm. somewhere on vacation by herself. Mm -hmm. Like I, that kind of gets into your DNA. Well, literally, I guess, but you know, <laughs> metaphorically at some point, And I, I appreciate her uh, persistence, her never backing down, her, her toughness. Right. And, um, and I'm really grateful for that. The four oldest of us are all girls and all of us are, we're called the sisters in the family. And I, every girlfriend who's dated either of my brothers, I think has been slightly terrified. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I appreciate my mom as a strong woman who, <laughs> who started all of that. <laughs> The, moms right they're the yeah and, well and Holly that's funny my, my friends call me whenever they need something they say hey tell your mom to pray for me or tell your mom to pray about this or I mean that that is just they know that they that have they, all the power they have all the power yeah, yeah happy Mother's does. Day oh yeah. thank you <laughs> happy Mother's Day to you and to all the moms happy Mother's yeah. Day <laughs> All right, so it's 10.02, so unfortunately we've run out of time. I feel no. like I've talked to you guys all day. Yes. <laughs> but um, thank you so much both for your time. This has been amazing. Such a great way to end our series. And thank yes. you to everybody who joined in today or and who has joined in for this whole semester. This has been amazing. So thank you so much. Happy Friday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.